move into the Christmas season. Such an incredible, wonderful thought that God loved us enough to send his son to earth to die in our place. Christmas is about the cross. We remember all of those wonderful angelic moments in the shepherds and the wise men and the gold and frankincense and the myrrh. But we need to remember that Jesus came to save sinners. He came to die in our place. It's a glorious season. Praise God. Please take your Bibles and turn back, if you will, to that portion of Scripture which we read just a moment ago over in Exodus chapter 15. There are Bibles in the pew in front of you. We're in Exodus chapter 15. We're looking today, part 10 of Bitter Waters and Sweet, Naomi in the Desert. And of course, we gave that title because Mara, the place where they found water, they couldn't drink it, means bitter. And that is what Naomi called herself when she returned. Her husband had died. Her two sons had died. One of her daughters-in-law had forsaken her. She came back a bitter woman. Her name, Naomi, means pleasant, but she gave herself the name Mara, which means bitter. And yet God, in the midst of her bitterness, gave her joy. Exodus chapter 15. Now, in our current text here in Exodus, we're studying Israel's rebellions in the wilderness wanderings. There were 10 of them. God specifically talks about 10 rebellions, and it was because of those 10 rebellions that God caused them all to die in the wilderness, and only their children inherited the land of promise. And so as we've been going through the different forms of rebellion, where they shook their fist at God and said they were not going to obey him, at those same 10 different times, we're looking at the principles so that we will not commit the same kind of rebellions that they committed. This first one is focused on murmuring and complaining, and we're going to get to that in just a little bit. But specifically, we discuss what God does when people rebel against him individually, and what God does when people rebel against his ordained leadership. Last week, we demonstrated that there are at least 12 principles that God has set out in the Bible for dealing with group rebellion. We studied in detail principles number one and two. We studied those extensively over a period of about six weeks. Last week, we covered briefly principles numbers three through eight. Today, we want to try to cover the remaining four principles in group rebellion settings. But first, let's have a quick review of principles three through eight when dealing with discerning group rebellion. How do you tell that it's happening? What do you do when it happens? How should you respond when someone around you is trying to raise group rebellion against someone in a position of authority? And you know there are four spheres of authority. There's the government, there's the church, there's the family, and there's the workplace. These principles of rebellion are, are valid in all four of those different spheres of authority that God has ordained. So you want to be sensitive that you don't fall into a category of becoming a rebel and coming under God's judgment as a result. So we looked at principle three, which is false accusations are always very pious, very religious sounding, very pompous, and also very self-serving. People always try to phrase their rebellion in the best possible light so it doesn't sound like rebellion. That there's really a good, solid, religious, pious reason for doing what they're doing. Moses responded to those blatantly false accusations that we saw in our text. And we saw there were two parts to the principle. Number one, he exposed the false accusation. And number two, he prayed what's called an imprecatory prayer. He prayed against the people. Moses was wroth, is verse 16, 15 and Numbers 16. Moses was very wroth and said unto the Lord, Respect not thou their offerings. I have not taken one ass from them, neither have I hurt one of them. That's what's called imprecatory prayer. You'll notice that David in the Psalms often prays against his enemies and prays against the enemies of God. Principle number four that we looked at very briefly, God deals first with subordinate religious rebels who challenge divinely appointed religious leader. They usually have some divinely appointed authority themselves, but a subservient level of authority. And we saw that with Korah, Nadab, and Abihu. 
We looked at principle five, which is subordinate religious leaders who are in rebellion usually try to instigate and gather support of the entire congregation before making their move. People, I've been in ministry for almost 45 years at this point. You stop and think about all the different events. You may know of some of them from this church. I know of them from many, many, many churches. This is the way rebels work. They figure we can't do it by ourselves, so let's get the congregation together. Let's talk to this person and try to pull them on the side and get them on our side. Then we'll go over and talk to this person over here and we'll you know, try to get them together and pull them on our side. You've seen it happen in the workplace. You see it happening all the time in government. Sometimes you see it happening in the family where a wife will try to pull the children over on her side against the father. God's not pleased with that. But God does this against the people who rebel by gathering support before they hatch their rebellion. Remember what it said in number 16, Korah gathered all the congregation against them under the door of the tabernacle of the congregation. Now God's glory appeared right at that moment so they couldn't merely rush in and take Moses and Aaron and stone them. The glory of the Lord shone up, but you see the methodology here. Be careful not to get involved in that. Number six, the sixth principle. We noted that God's protection of Moses and Aaron relates to the doctrine of separation. Now I'm going to come back to that a little bit later today. If the congregation follows the rebellious leaders, they open themselves to God's judgment. The Lord spake unto Moses and Aaron, saying, Separate yourselves from among the congregation, that I may consume them in a moment. If you're a godly person, don't participate in rebellion. Separate yourself from it, otherwise you come under the judgment of God. Principle seven, a godly, qualified, appointed, ordained leader still cares about the congregation, even when they foolishly follow rebellious, subordinate leaders. <laughs> Moses and Aaron, you know, they could have said, all right, Lord, we're out of the way. The Lord of God! They didn't do that. They showed they were of a different spirit a different character, a character that had compassion, not merely, we're going to get even with those rebels. What did they do? They fell upon their faces and said, O oh God, the God of spirits of all flesh, shall one man sin and with I be wroth with all the congregation? God was going to fry all of them. God tells Moses on one occasion, look, I'll get rid of all of these people and I'll make you a great nation. You and your descendants. I'll give up on the rest of those guys and I'll take you only. And Moses still begged that God wouldn't do it because of his great promises to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Dear people, do you have that kind of compassion? Where when people who perhaps in your work under your authority, rebel against you. You have the kind of compassion that prays for them. And saying, saying, well, I'm going to get the goods on them and then I'm going to fire them. How do you respond? We see different character qualities in the man Moses and Aaron. We saw principle eight, God hears the prayers of a righteous man. God hears the prayers of a righteous man. James tells us that in the New Testament. Confess your faults one to another. Pray one for another that you may be healed. The effectual, fervent prayer of a righteous man availeth much. God hears the prayers of a righteous man. We saw that God spares congregations based on the prayer of a righteous man if the congregation obeys quickly. And we saw how the congregation departed from Korah and Dathan and Abiram on every side and how God destroyed them. God killed the open rebel, excuse me, rebels and the recalcitrant rebels at the same time but by different methods. Remember he opened up the pit for one group and they fell straight into hell. We talked about that. We saw that hell is also described as a flaming fire and that's how the open rebels were judged. They were burned to death by flames from the Shekinah glory. Some of them dropped straight into hell. That's number 16, verses 28 through 34. And those who burned to death 
That was verses 35 through 37. God does not tolerate rebellion. You know, we need to balance the fact that God is a righteous God who, who consumes the wicked, who refuse to repent, but he's a God of mercy and grace and love for those who repent and turn to him. Don't take just one half of it. The liberals take the God is love half and they live the other half out. There are some who only preach hellfire and brimstone and judgment and they forget that God so loved the world that he sent Christ to die for our sins. There is a balance. Think of a great wheel. One side of the great wheel is painted black. One side is painted white. And here is man. And man also is like a little tiny wheel. One side is painted black. One side is painted white. And the two have cogs that intermesh with one another. And as a wheel turns, it brings the opposite side of the wheel against itself. When man is in sin, here's the black side of the wheel. You have the black side of the wheel on God's side, which is judgment. When man repents and turns the other side, the wheel of God turns also, and we have God's grace and mercy. Judgment against sin, grace and mercy against confession and repentance, turning to Christ, is what we talk about in the New Testament. But here we see people who would not repent, who refused to turn when they were warned, and God judged them. Now, today, that brings us to principle number nine, but before continuing with principle nine, I want to go back to principle number six that I mentioned just a moment ago and tie murmuring and complaining into the very important New Testament doctrine of separation. Do you remember principle six? I read it to you a minute ago. I told you we're going to look at that. We noted, this is principle six, that God's protection of Moses and Aaron relates to the doctrine of separation. If the congregation follows the rebellious leaders, they open themselves to judgment. God said, separate yourself from the congregation. They've rebelled. Now, in the New Testament, the doctrine of separation is very clear. It's a very, very clarion call. It's divided into two basic areas, what we call practical separation, number one, and number two, theological or ecclesiastical separation. Now, some of you probably have not read the little brochure that I wrote back in 2008, and then I revised it again in 2011 and 2016, but there are copies of it on literature tables around the auditorium. Should I ask you, how many of you have read this and have you show of hands? How many of you have read it all the way through? We have a couple. <laughs> you ought to read this. This summarizes for you what Bible Presbyterians believe. What makes us different from other Presbyterians? That's the title of this little brochure. And it has 13 different sections. Oh, it is a... I worked a long time on this. You ought to read it. <laughs> it has one on eschatology. That's the doctrine of last things, prophecy. It has a whole section on missions. It has a whole section on separation. It has a whole section on Bible translations. It has a section on creation. It has a section on worship and music. It has one on expository preaching, one on Christian education, one on evangelism, one on the charismatic movement, one on patriotism, one on the free market, one on current issues. You didn't know there are all kinds of things that Bible Presbyterians hold to and have historically. But you know, the doctrine of separation is a very important doctrine in the New Testament. I'm just going to read you a couple of paragraphs out of that little brochure that I just showed you a moment ago. This is very pertinent to our discussion of what's going on with Moses and the children of Israel when they murmur and complain against the Lord. Separation. The strong, vibrant, robust Christian life maintains a balance 
between separation and unity. Remember we talked about balance a moment ago between God's love and God's judgment, man's sin and man's repentance. There's a balance in this area too. Bible Presbyterian Church of Collingswood believes in A, ecclesiastical separation, B, ecclesiastical unity, C, practical separation, and D, practical unity. Ecclesiastical separation, remember, God called Moses and Aaron to separate, means that we do not participate in theological or evangelistic ecumenical activities or events that include Roman Catholics or apostate Protestant denominational leaders or their representatives. Paul forbids that in 2 Corinthians 6. Even though we may agree with a limited number of positions officially taken by their groups, but we don't get up on the same stage with them. We don't say the same things that they say. We don't call them brothers. We don't show up at medical councils in Rome, for example. For example, on many conservative national moral and spiritual issues, such as abortion, euthanasia, stem cell research, and other bioethical issues, we might arrive at similar conclusions to those held by groups with whom we have no fellowship. In such cases, we consider ourselves to be co-belligerents, not allies, with certain conservative-minded individuals and denominations from whom we are ecclesiastically separated. That means separated by the church, theologically. And with whom we could neither have Christian fellowship nor participate in any religious endeavor. In particular, we avoid, reprove, and expose all those pseudo-Christian denominations and cults that deny that salvation is by grace alone through faith alone, in Christ alone, or who maintain that there are other sources of authority that are equal to or greater than the scriptures of the Old and New Testaments. Now, there's a lot packed into that. That's a, an entire course in theology, but condensed into one paragraph. But we have unity. On the other hand, we warmly embrace other Bible-believing fundamentalists, regardless of their denominational labels. For example, we love fundamental Baptists. <laughs> Did you know there are actually some fundamental Methodists who have no part in the worldwide Methodist denomination? There are actually fundamentalists who have different labels than we do. They are willing to separate from apostasy and who believe the fundamentals of the faith, and there are five fundamentals of the faith, basically. His inerrant, infallible, confluent, verbal, plenary, and finished inspiration of the scripture, the absolute undiminished deity of our Lord Jesus Christ, his sinless humanity through the literal virgin birth, his genuine literal and supernatural miracles, his true substitutionary death on the cross of Calvary for our sins, his literal bodily resurrection from the dead, and his literal bodily ascension into heaven from which he will come to judge the living and the dead. That is most clearly seen in our participation with the ICCC, that's the International Council of Christian Churches, which is opposed to the World Council of Christian Churches and our refusal uh, to join the Neo-Evangelical National Association of Evangelicals, although we recognize that the NAE has many true Christians in its ranks. You say, well, Pastor, you're getting awfully technical for us here. That's, folks, because the devil has done a lot of deception. If you're not articulate, if you don't have your antenna up all the time, you have the enemy coming across the lines. If the guard post falls asleep, the enemy infiltrates the territory and destroys you. That has happened in literally thousands of churches worldwide over the last 2,000 years. Practical separation is grounded in and flows from and is impossible apart from ecclesiastical separation, 2 Corinthians 7.1. This means that we believe Christians should lead, now listen carefully, this means that we believe Christians should lead holy lives of moral purity, separated from worldly activities that stimulate the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life. Because certain things clearly defile the body, which is the temple of the Holy Spirit, it has historically been and continues to be our strong conviction that the drinking of beverage alcohol and the use of tobacco in any of its forms is sin. It defiles the body. Any use of pornography is both vile and degrading sin because it not only defiles the body, but the spirit as well. That's even worse because it doesn't just defile your body. It defiles your spirit. All forms of immorality condemned in scripture are also vile sin 
and any person claiming to be a Christian who participates in such sin should be excluded from the church until he or she clearly and genuinely repents. Legitimately prescribed medical use of controlled substances to heal and preserve the body is both proper and good. However, the abuse of any controlled substance, including the abuse of prescription drugs, is sin. Additionally, we believe that it is sinful violation of biblical stewardship to gamble. Further, a Christian who wishes to please the Lord and not cause others to stumble through lust, inflamed passion, covetousness, anger, or pride will dress and groom modestly, humbly, neatly, cleanly, appropriately, in accordance with the commands of Scripture, in deference to the church, and in a way that honors God more than man. Those who manifest a stubborn will and knowledgeable spirit of rebellion, ah, we're suddenly getting back here to this rebellion issue, aren't we? In their clothing, grooming, and music, literature, and other outward manifestations of the inward man should be disciplined in love with the goal of restoration. However, when such is not possible, the unrepentant sinner should be subject to church discipline and excluded from fellowship. Practical unity. In the same way as ecclesiastical unity, our practical unity with other Christians seeks to mirror our convictions regarding our desire to lead holy lives that please the Savior. We are to seek the fellowship of other godly, separated, Bible-believing Christians wherever we are at any given point in time, on vacation, traveling, at home, school, or elsewhere, even though they may not bear an identical denominational label. Separation. Now you say, okay, so what in the world does that have to do with the children of Israel in the wilderness? We've been looking at that passage where God said to Moses and Aaron, I want you to separate yourselves from the congregation that I may consume them. So now let me show you how the doctrine of separation ties in with the ten times of rebellion and complaining in the wilderness. The epistle of Jude in the New Testament is one of the two principal books dealing with apostasy and apostates. The other book is 2 Peter. Jude is only one chapter long. It's a very short book. But it's very powerful in its description of apostates. Let me start first with the three key verses that deal with this issue. These are verses 14, 15, and 16. <clears throat> he goes back and reminds you this is a very age-old problem. In fact, it takes us all the way back to Enoch. You remember, Enoch walked with God and was not because God took him. And that was right before the flood, God's judgment on the earth. Enoch was a prophet, according to Jude. Enoch also, the seventh from Adam, prophesied of these, that is, of these apostates, saying, Behold, the Lord cometh with ten thousand of his saints to execute judgment upon all, and to convince all that are ungodly among them of all their ungodly deeds, which they have ungodly committed, and of all their hard speeches, which ungodly sinners have spoken against him. Now that should have given you a, a, a hint right up front. <laughs> Remember we talked about how Moses pointed out to the children of Israel, they weren't rebelling against him, they were rebelling against God. Because when you rebel against God's ordained leadership, you're saying, God, you're stupid. God, you don't know what you're doing. I think I know better than you as to who should be leader here. Jude talks about the apostates in the context of three verses dealing with rebellion and then listen to what he says. These, that is these apostates, these ones who are ungodly, who have ungodly deeds, have ungodly committed all their deeds, who have uh, uh, hard speeches, that they have ungodly sinners have spoken against him. Listen to how he describes them. These are murmurers, complainers, walking after their own lusts, and their mouth speaketh great swelling words, having men's persons in admiration because of advantage. That is, by doing this, they can take advantage of others. That's exactly what's going on in our text. And in each of the ten points of rebellion, you find that exact same set of principles and central to it is these are murmurers, complainers. That's one of the key character problems 
that's manifested by people who are apostates, people who are under God's judgment. Now, you know, and I did a whole series on apostasy and heresy, that there are two different kinds of apostates and there are two different kinds of heretics. We're not going to go over all of that now, but heresy deals with causing divisions in the church. Apostasy means a falling away from the faith. Apostasy is the Greek word from which we get our English word apostasy. So I'm not going to go all, over all of that, but remember, apostates are characterized by many things. False doctrine, sloth, lust, adultery, fornication, argumentative spirits, endless genealogies, denial of creation, denial of the global flood, denial of moral standards, denial, denial of literal prophecy, lies, instability, scripture twisting, false gospels, that is salvation by works and other means, false prophecies, false teachings, heresies, approval of sodomy, boy, we have a a whole sweep of so-called churches today that are approving that and even ordaining those people. Uncleanness, rebellion against authority, rebellion against government, filthy conversation. I mean, there's a humongous list of things that defines the apostates. But central to it, how do you first tell? Because they sneak in. They creep in unawares. You don't see them coming. But here's something that always shows up first. These are murmurers complainers walking after their own lusts. They always want to do it their own way. If you don't satisfy them, you're going to have trouble. So you better listen to what they say because they're going to use a crowbar against you and they will topple you if you don't do what they want you to do. Listen to what Peter says. These are wells without water. Suppose you're crawling across the desert and you see a, a sign up ahead that says, well, water here. And you go over, there's a big rock over it and you move the rock out of the way and there's, there, there's a bucket on a string and you let it down and you let it down and instead of hearing a splash, you hear clunk. Wells without water. They offer you something, but they don't give it to you. Clouds they are carried with a tempest to whom the mist of darkness is reserved forever. For when they speak great swelling words of vanity, they allure through the lust of the flesh. They're going to appeal to your flesh. And your flesh has all kinds of facets to it. Some people are tempted by money. Some people are tempted by sex. Some people are tempted by sloth. Some people are tempted by food, gluttony. Man, they're into that. You know, the seven deadly sins. Through the lust of the flesh, through much wantonness, those that are clean escaped from them who live in error. You think you're doing okay, but these people will come along and say, look, there's a sucker, like P.T. Barnum used to say, <laughs> Barnum and Bailey Circus, there's a sucker born every minute, and the circus is going to take advantage of him. For while they promise them liberty, they themselves are the servants of corruption. They'll say, look, why do you bother with all those silly rules? Don't you realize you're 21 and you're an American? Come on, you don't have to follow all that stupid religious stuff. We're in the modern age. You can do it. They promise them liberty. Licentiousness is not liberty. Lust is not freedom. They promise them liberty. They themselves are the servants of corruption, for of whom a man is overcome, of the same as he brought into bondage. You know, you can become a slave to drugs. You can become a slave to porn. You can become a slave to food. You can become a slave to anything, and you think you're having fun, and you're at liberty, and then you try to get out, and you, you realize you're chained. You can't get out. Apostates want to get you in that position so that you can't get away. For if they have escaped the pollutions of the world through the knowledge of the Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, if then they are entangled again therein and overcome, the latter end is worse with them than the beginning. Now listen to this. Better not to hear the gospel than to hear it and have this happen to you. For it had been better for them not to have known the way of righteousness than, after they have known it, to turn from the holy commandment delivered unto them 
But it has happened unto them, according to the true proverb, the dog is turned to his own vomit again, and the sow that was washed to her wallowing in the mire. Dear people, some of you here, some listening over the internet, some who may hear this sermon in the future, if you've heard the gospel of Christ, and I think everybody in this room has, that Jesus Christ is both God and man. He's one person with two natures, a divine and human nature, perfect. That he died for your sins. That he was buried and rose again the third day according to the scriptures. And that by placing your faith in him alone, you receive the gift of eternal life. If you have heard that, and you just have, and you think about it, and you say, you know, I think I really prefer the lifestyle I've been leading. I really prefer the fun that I'm having. And maybe at a later date, maybe I'll trust Jesus on my deathbed or something. Of course, you don't know when that'll happen. We saw that a week ago. But maybe I'll, I'll repent on my deathbed. What the scripture says, it had been better for them not to have known the way of righteousness than after they have known it to turn from the holy commandment delivered unto them. Have you heard the truth? Have you pondered it for a moment? It sunk in and you thought, I'm going to reject that. By not responding in positive terms, you do reject it. I remember sharing Christ with a young man many years ago, 1968 in fact. I shared Christ with two different young men. I was working as the host captain at the Sermons from Science Pavilion at the World's Fair in San Antonio, 1968, called Hemisphere. We shared the gospel through various films that we showed. I would invite people standing on a platform out in front of the pavilion, talking on a microphone, inviting people to come by. And I shared the gospel with two young men. I won't tell you the whole stories, but one young man, a, a young Jewish fellow who was working at another one of the pavilions, came and sat in the shadow of the beer pavilion, which was right across from a Lone Star Brewery. And he listened to me talk, and he came up to me, and we engaged ourselves in conversation most of that summer while the fair was going on. And in the end, I said to him, Danny, I have answered every one of your questions. He, he was Jewish. He kept throwing up all these questions. How could Jesus be the Messiah? And so I said to him, Danny, I have answered every one of your questions. The fair is soon to be over. He was a student at Johns Hopkins University. I was at Gordon College up in Massachusetts. I've answered every one of your questions, and you've admitted that the answers worked. So the only issue left is, will you trust Christ as your Savior? And he says, well, he says, you know, I've got to be honest, you really did answer all the objections that I've had. But he said, I'm having too much fun right now. I don't want to trust Jesus because that would change my life. He was living with two girls at the time. He was a college student and he was shacking up with two sisters, a 14-year-old and a 16-year-old. And he said, I'm having too much fun. And he turned his back on the gospel. I wrote to him for several years. The last time I heard from him, he was sitting in a cave in Arizona someplace. He'd gotten into Hindu mysticism. And he wrote a letter to me called The State of the Danny Address. And he wandered on and on. It was clear he was into some kind of drugs because of the way his sentences were formed. But at the end of that letter, he said to me, Christian, if I ever come to the end of my rope, 
I'll come back to you because you're the only one who has ever told me the truth. And that was the last time I heard from Danny Bellin. 1968. Now let me tell you the story of another young man that same summer. Ned Hutchinson. He came, saw our films, became very excited. Came up to me, I was the host captain, I was in charge of about 140 young people uh, who volunteered on a daily basis to come out and pass out literature on the fairgrounds. And uh, he said, I'd like to become one of these hosts. He was in the military, stationed at one of the local Air Force bases. He says, on my days off, I'd love to, like to come and, uh, and work with you here. I said, well, okay, just fill out one of our applications. I'm sitting, eating lunch, and he's going through it. And then he says, man, that's really a hard question. I thought, there are no hard questions on that. Some of you have heard me tell this story, but I'm showing you a contrast between two men. I said, well, answer it the best you can. It was a question, what must you do to be saved? I said, boy, that's a hard question. I thought that's not a hard question for someone who knows. He gave it back to me and I was doing the interview. And uh, he'd put down everything from helping little old ladies across the street to washing the dishes for your mother. I mean, it was like, he wouldn't believe this list of stuff he thought you had to do to get to heaven. We spent two and a half, three hours talking, and I tried to find some common ground where we could start. And I finally asked him the question, well, Ned, do you believe that the Bible is inspired? And he said, oh, yes. I thought, whoa, after all these weird answers I've been getting, giddy? I said, now, you know, some people think it's inspiring that they read it and they get a charge. But I'm talking about, do you believe that every word, every letter, every part of every letter was a given from God and that there are no mistakes in it and it doesn't teach error as truth? He said, that's what I believe. I thought, I don't know where he came up with that, but man, that's a great place to start. I said, well, then, Ned, what we have to do is look at what the Bible says about salvation. And he had various questions and it took us back to the Old Testament and to the New Testament prophecies and... Finally, at the end of that time, I looked at him as I had at Danny. I said, Ned, today you're going to make a decision. Either you will make the decision to walk out of here without trusting Christ, and that is a decision, or you will make a decision to trust Jesus Christ to forgive you for your sins. He is the only way to heaven. Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man comes to the Father but by me. And Ed responded differently than Danny did. Ned looked at me and he said, you know, if I made that decision, that would be the most important decision I ever made in my life. And I thought, thank you, Lord. The Spirit of God is working in the spirit of this young man. And I said, Ned, would you like to pray right now and ask Christ to forgive your sins, to give you a new life, to take control of your life? Would you like to trust him now by believing the promise that he said he died for you, was buried and rose again, and he nodded his head, yes, I would. And we bowed our heads. I didn't have to lead him in a prayer. He began to pray one of the most beautiful, humble prayers I've ever heard. He trusted Christ. He confessed his sin. He thanked God for sending Jesus to die in his place. Now, we covered two and a half hours of scripture, all kinds of prophecies. So he was remembering some of these things and actually sticking them into his prayer. He got up so excited for the rest of the summer. Every time he had time off from the base, he was there. He was running between people, begging them to come and hear the good news. How many of you are doing it? Do you know Jesus? 
Many years later, I buried Ned, and you've heard me tell that story at Crohn's disease. And he ended up dying of a brain tumor. I was holding his hand at his bedside as he was slipping into eternity. He lived in California, he ended up living in Alabama, and I was able to go see him in Alabama. He's in heaven. Danny? I don't know. Maybe he trusted Christ. But it looks more to me like what we had here. For it had been better for them not to have known the way of righteousness than after they had known it to turn from the holy commandment delivered unto them. But it is happened unto them according to the true proverb. The dog is turned to his own vomit again, and the sow that was washed to her wallowing in the mire. Apostasy, there are apostates in the church. Many times it's hard to tell just exactly who they are. But we're focusing on the key character quality that Jude gives us, murmuring and complaining because that is precisely what characterized the children of Israel in the wilderness. We'll have to end there for today. Our gracious Heavenly Father, we thank you once again for the power of your word. Father, without the Lord Jesus Christ, we have no hope. And so many times, Father, we murmur and complain, we bellyache, we gripe. We don't like things when they're not exactly like we want them. We decide that we are the final standard and not the word of God. Father, we confess that as sin. Certainly because now we're coming into your presence to partake of the Lord's table. Oh, Father, it's a very dangerous thing for someone to partake of these elements while they have sin in their lives, especially the sin of rebellion. We pray, Father, that even now each of us would be examining our hearts to see if there is any wicked way in us to confess that sin and then that you would lead us in the way of righteousness as your word declares. Father, take your word and apply it to our hearts. You alone can do that, and we pray that you will, in Jesus' name, amen. Our closing hymn in preparation for the Lord's table is number 413, 413, Break Thou the Bread of Life. We'll only sing the first and fourth verses. We'll stand to sing.